If you're listening on uh, live stream, thank you for joining in for Zoom. Let's get started. And so we'll open this part with some prayer, and then we're just going to dive in. Study my Bible. What did I do with my Bible? All right. So <laughs> Philippians chapter two. If you want to turn there? You got a Bible? If you want to turn there and follow along? So I'll read some verses. That's for the opportunity to discuss your word and talk about family and important. So I'll put it to you. Let's give us wisdom and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so marriage, well, that's a tough one, isn't it? Tough to talk about marriage and family. Uh, we're going to follow along with Philippians <laughs> chapter 2. Kind of keep this in mind, but it says, uh, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Think about this personally. But in lowness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Okay, so thinking better than your spouse. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. This is this let this mind be you, which was also in Christ. Jesus lives. So our example is to be like Jesus, even in marriage. That's tough, isn't it? Because marriage is like a CD. Remember, does anybody remember what CDs were? Nobody remembers. Do y'all have? Yeah, I was back in the tape days. You were probably in that. So <laughs> CD. You know when you, you buy a CD, Christie's turned fifty. Oh, it's just a lot of experience. But anyway. God, a, <laughs> a CD has like, remember buying those and like one or two really good songs come out and you're like, man, this is awesome. Can you get that CD? But then you get it, you listen to that song, and then you go to the other ones and it's kind of kind of like this. Like you keep going through the songs that you find. You're only really can only find like three good songs. And how many are on CD? Like 15? So when you get married. You know, in the dating part, everybody's doing their best. Remember that? Like, you give your best, you dress your best, you look your best, and uh, you kind of assume that's just the way it is. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you get married, and you've been giving your best, but you have to that with that person a whole lot. And then you're with them every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, even your best friend, you would not stay with that home. You love your best friend, and you would send them home. You know, anybody stay with their best friend all the time? So they say marry your best friend, but actually that would be staying with your friend all the time is quite good. So that CD is you find a couple things, and all of a sudden you're not careful. You're with that person, and you start focusing instead on those couple good songs that you really remember. You start focusing on the bad songs, and then all of a sudden your mind starts going with that before you know it. You're starting to struggle because your focus is on the wrong things. So you got to number one, put your spouse first, and you do that because of Jesus Christ. Now, the only way a marriage works is if you try to grow it first in your relationship with the Lord, because everything about marriage God created, and Jesus Christ showed us exactly how we live. He gave up the luxuries of heaven for us, so we. Or to give up for somebody else. He came from a glorious place to a sin cursed world. He gave up his life to obedient even to the cross for you. And so in marriage, God says, I want you to submit. I want you to be faithful. I want you to express that love to your spouse. And God created the home. He created it to be a really good thing. He wants it to be exciting. He wants it to be a um, representation of him, but the problem is problems, right? We all have problems. We're all sinful. Let's face it. We've had uh, sin creates problems. So we're not perfect. Except that I'm fast I have perfect marriage. Uh, my wife's not. So we're still working on things. <laughs> no, we still have a struggle uh, of sin. And so the number one thing is i got to draw closer to the Lord and the Closer I draw to him, the more I'm going to do what 
God wants me to do, and that'll help me uh, with things. Six Ziggler said this, you can have everything in life you want, and you'll just help other people get what they want. Remember that. Uh, marriage is kind of like a dessert. Dessert's good unless you miss the main ingredient. Me and Bailey made brownies one time, and we put everything in one thing. Sure, we forgot it. But the ingredient. They turn out to be part of the rock and salt. They had everything else that one ingredient. You know what the one ingredient is? You gotta have one ingredient in life, especially family, is selflessness. What kills a marriage? Selfishness. That's the one key. Selfishness is the number one thing that causes marriages to have struggles. Humility, humbleness, as we read, will cause a marriage to be more fruitful. But if you're self-centered, it's going to cause you don't want everything your way. So you get married, it's all about getting the other person, or hey, if you get married to benefit me, what this person gives me. And that's not how Jesus was. Look at it. Where did he say there? Look at chapter two. Let this same mind be in you. Uh, he made himself, verse seven, of no reputation, took one form of a servant for us, for you and me, and was made in the likeness of him. So that's what he gave up. And he says, Look, not every man on his own things, but also on the things. Of others, so it's important not to look at yourself, and it, you have to forcibly do that. You know, you're all wanting what's best for you. Y'all do. Eighth grade, I had one of those uh, mirrors on my locker. Anybody have a mirror on their locker? Brittany did. Somebody else? Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. All right, whenever Bailey gets it from eighth grade, first thing I did, you come from Shannon to eighth grade, it's like a shell shock, man. I mean, everything's perfect. Shannon, you get there, but we've got fears. <laughs> There's some that's been there for years. They're <laughs> men. <laughs> they are men. And, uh, I got made fun of, but I had to have my mirror. I had to have a mirror. My mom like, why? Because I was the one doing it. I was worried about brand nice. And that never changes as you get older unless you submit to God's word. It's natural for you to want to be number one. That's natural. For you to want your spouse to put you number one, for you to worry about yourself. And as long as your spouse puts you first, you're going to be okay. But that was not the mind of Christ. And too often we, we focus on ourselves. Matthew 7 3 says, Why beholdest thou the mode that's in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thy own eye? We always can find faults in our spouse. Or anybody else for that matter. Find faults in everybody. We look at people we work with. Boy, that person, they look how bad they are. And it's so easy to do that. The Pharisees we talked about this morning, we've been talking about how Jesus was in front of them and they missed it because they were blinded by their own pride. They were selfish. They wanted their own power. And that's how you want things. And you got to supernaturally be different if you want to have a strong marriage. You got to be like Christ. So it, I forgot my thing. This will work here. So, the idea of that is this. You're walking around with this in your eye. This is the passage. Is that kind of awkward? Y'all see this? All right. And then TJ's got a something smaller than a toothpick. Real, real tiny. And yet I'm talking about how bad he is. And uh, I'm worried about that little toothpick. And this is what I got in my eye. And the verse is this. Hey, you need to look in the mirror. I had a 65-year-old lady down this city. Everybody my age looks so old. It's weird. I don't. I don't look old, but everybody else does. And I was saying, well, you're not really looking. <laughs> <laughs> she looked really old. I didn't know that, but she did. That's just face the facts. That's our mindset. Everybody else got problems with me. Everybody does. No, you have problems. You're a sinner, and you got to focus on how can I get better? How can I improve with my spouse? You got to have that mindset. Um, Think of others instead of yourself. It's kind of like a love bank. You know, you love it when you get paid and money goes in your account. You got money in there and you go out and eat. Everybody has a good time. Or if somebody gives you money, somebody buys you a meal. As long as your account's building up, you're good. As long as you're working at it, you're good. You've got a job because you have expenses throughout the week. You always have to pay bills. Bills always come. So your account's always being drawn down, but as long as you're working at it, you're putting more in. As long as you put more in, it's coming out, uh, you feel good about it. But all of a sudden, if you quit putting in, there's always something coming out, and you start to get stressed, and uh, you have to be putting in constantly, your spouse, constantly. What is my, what, you get married, you love that person. I mean, you got dated them, 
and you love that person and you wanted to please them, you made you made them happy, they wouldn't marry you. You just sat around and made a man all the time, they wouldn't marry you. But all of a sudden, if you're not careful, you lose that focus, and then you're not focused on what what is it that they need. I would be like Christ, and I need to treat my spouse the way. What is it they need that's going to help? And you stop doing that. If you stop doing that, you're not putting money in the bank. And all of a sudden, your account, when you got married, you know, it's got like $10,000. So you get married, you're on cloud nine. Everything's perfect. The wedding, the honeymoon, everything's perfect. Maybe you're not like in a life, maybe you're one of those fat and stuff. Or what happened here? Preacher never said anything about that. But that happens. And so you can live for a while with a little bit of a problem, but if you're not putting in that account, it keeps getting down. If it gets down close to zero, you're going to have sort of major problems. The good news is you can always put back into it, but you have to be willing, number one. People come in and say, our marriage is, is struggling. And I say, do you want to work at it? And one of them says, yes, I want to do it. I mean, not really, but I'm here. That's not going to work. You know, you got to be willing. If you're willing, you can turn around anything. And you can have a really, really good marriage. And if you have a really good one, know that you will have to keep working at it. Because the devil wants to destroy your home very clearly. And everybody has different... Uh, everybody was raised it. And when you come into marriage, you got to realize that too. For example, I'm reading uh, the thing about Tim Keller, who's a preacher. And his... His wife, I mean, I'm sorry, his mom did everything. And that's how he was raised. His dad just worked all the time, never home. Whereas his wife, when he got married, it was different. Her dad did everything. And so one day she said, Hey, the diapers, uh, no, he had the babies, the diaper exchange. She said, Well, my shoe fits. And he said, No, the diaper needs changed. He was really frustrated. She's like, Well, change it. He said, Well, that's not my job. And he said, boy, we had some big problems. See, I did not realize that because I grew up in a home that that's just the way it was. I didn't really know any different. And the opposite was true for her. She grew up in a home that was totally different than that. So you got to realize that and say, what does God say and how should I? And so tonight, just for a few minutes, we're going to look at some keys, kind of introduction. What can help you to take away as we, we look at some things of communication uh, is important. Some things on treating your spouse, etc. But Let's just look at maybe five tonight. Five things that are five keys that help you um, in your marriage. And really, they're love languages and how you uh, respond to those. So the first one is words of affirmation, encouragement. You know, men need encouragement, but we can't help it. That's the way we were created. Okay? We need encouragement. The biggest thing in the world is you can encourage men. That's why even people come into church, they love staying if they feel encouraged. Husbands, wife, everybody needs encouragement. Men more than women. They need just encouragement, respect. That's one of the top five for men. We'll look at it in a second. Men's top five are totally different than women's. Uh, there's a book called Men Are uh, Waffles, Ladies Are Noodles. It's so true. We get in a box and we can't see anything. And ladies get frustrated. Even my daughters and my wife, they'll be talking to me, and I'm in a box. That's just the way I was. I mean, I am literally watching, and I hear nothing that they're saying. Nothing. And then they'll say, Did you hear what I said? And I'll sometimes lie as a preacher. And I'll say, well, Yeah. Um, and it's way off. It's not in the world in close. That's the way we're designed. When we're in a box. We have to tackle that box, get open the door, get out. And then get in the other box. Ladies can be carrying a baby, a child, cooking dinner, talking on the phone, surfing the web. They can touch and do it all the time. Amazing. And ladies are just amazing. We can. So, for one, ladies got to give us some slack. But, guys, number two, you got to sometimes get out of that box, close the door, and then get in the box that uh, spouse is in so that you can actually listen to them. So you don't get in that box, you're not going to listen to them, they, they say. But, encouragement. Uh, does anybody really respond to respond well criticism? Very few people do. Coaches would say you should have uh, two, especially with kids, so important with kids. You have to correct kids, but they need two words of encouragement for every word of uh, criticism. Because constant criticism creates a uh, a bad feeling towards the other person that was giving criticism. Here's a great example using different words. 
So you tell your wife, Tyler, you ain't made that pie in two years. And I like that pie. So you need to make it. Not that Tyler's ever done that, but now this Kelsey will be like, oh, that's awesome. Let me go make that pie for you, honey. Or what if Tyler says, man, you know what, Kelsey, you make the, there's nobody in the world that makes a pie better than you. Kelsey's all like, yeah, it tastes so good. I would just love to have one tonight. That would be awesome to have one tonight. Now, what's, is it a different communication there? Kelsey's like, oh, well, Tyler likes that. I want to please him and he's very kind of ways to do it. Those are just tiny little things that make a huge difference in communication with each other. Um, how you say something. Be careful what you say, how you say it, and why you say it. Very important. Learn to listen to the person. Well, I love that Jesus was a, a listener. Learn to handle your anger. Well, this is a big one. Now, I've really had to work on this a lot. Learn to handle your anger. Very biblical. Uh, Jesus was mocked. He was beaten. He was crucified. I mean, someone talked to the sun guy and spit in their face. Now, I hope your spouse never spits in your face. But they did everything possible to uh, provoke him. And all he had to do was this. Because he did it in the garden when he just said, I am. And they all fell down. So all he had to do was go. But yet he did not do that. He contained his composure for you. And so for us, we have to be willing to contain our composure. I'm still working on that guy. By the way, I'm telling you what I'm working on. That's what this uh, is about. So, containing your composure as you communicate is crucial. And then the anger, not having, number one, outbursts of anger, that's not good. Or suppressing it. You know, if you suppress it, it's kind of like a crock pot. You know, me, it's going to come out. You ever had to have, like, you just say something, and all of a sudden the person just explodes? It's because it built up. And you can't let that happen either. So that's communication. Uh, let things go and talk through those. Learn to avoid certain words. Is there certain words that just get your uh, get your spouse refraining from critical words? Anybody have one here they can think of? There are certain things that you kind of keep in your back pocket like this, you know. Because when your spouse starts getting to you, you want to get back at them. I mean, I'm just, this is the truth. Right? So you just say something you know you're going to get them. And that's not what God wants you to do. Learn to not dwell in the past. This is one of the biggest ones because we all fail and we make mistakes. And sometimes it's so hard for a spouse to get over a past wrong and move forward. But you say, all right, I'm, I'm done with that in the past. But you're really not. Because forgiveness is you can never forget the past. Understand that you can't. You can't. It's impossible. I can sit here and try my best. I can't forget it. But what I can do through reading the Bible, through praying, I can learn not to bring up the past, and I can learn not to let the past affect my future decisions. I can allow it not to affect how I'm going to treat myself. That's forgiveness. That's what forgiveness is. It's hey, let's just mark off the past. I realize you made a mistake. You're changing. I'm forgiving you, and we're moving forward. That is so crucial uh, to let go of the past. So that's all just in words that we use. Number two is acts of service. What is it that people enjoy? You know, if, if you're in business, normally you take somebody to lunch. They repeat you guys. Take somebody to lunch, but you're giving them something. You're buying their lunch, and they feel almost obligated. They do. They feel obligated to do business with you because you're doing something for them that they enjoy. What is it? That is an act of service that your spouse likes it when you do it. Does anybody want to give an example here? Oh, they claim case. For middle of us, that's number one priority right there. Uh, we got two year olds who think they're nice and neat. They're messy. Right? They like to pay. They like to do all these things. They don't like to clean up. Right? They're working on that themselves. But yeah, that's a great one. So, what is those things that your spouse really? enjoys it when you do that. Now it goes all the way back to I gotta be making sure I want to please my spouse and I'm doing it not because maybe they deserve it, but because Jesus tells me that's how I want you to be. I want you to be Christ like and there's gonna be times when your spouse don't deserve it. Uh there's gonna be times when other people you're serving don't deserve it, but you are to be Christ like in how you live and you're to find out what 
uh, what they like and do it. They like carrot cake, don't make apple pie. Right? Make carrot cake. It sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? There was a story Tim Keller told of uh, for Christmas one year. He got his wife a fur coat. I think it was him. They remember that. And his wife was like, oh, this is nice. He's like, he got mad. It's a fur coat. She said, you spent a fortune finally on a fur coat and I wanted a washing machine. <laughs> because that's who she was. She liked it. Now, some ladies do not get a washing machine. Every lady's different, right? But she did. And then for, for him, she got him some white t-shirts for Christmas. She was all excited. I got some white t-shirts. Just, you look like you're not happy. And he said, it's white t-shirts. I want a golf club. Because he wanted <laughs> Well, but she was driven by things for the house and that excited her he missed it. So you know if you're on the wrong radio station, you miss it. Probably like there's a great message on there, but you were tuned into the wrong radio station, it doesn't matter. So you gotta be tuned in to like, hey, what is my wife? Sometimes you just need to sit down, figure it out, right? What is it that you really like? Let me write down five. What if I did five things for you? What are them? Pretty simple, isn't it? Tell your spouse to write it down. And then you have to say either, I'm not doing this, that's ridiculous, or you know what? I'm going to work on doing those and see how big of a difference it can make. Amazing difference. What is my spouse? What makes them tick? What excites them? Brittany, I can help you out back there. I can take a hundred of chainsaw for Christmas. He's number one in his lips. I mean, I, it's bad to say, but I spent a lot of time with Hunter uh, since, since high school. So anyway, four or five pounds of stamp. Spam. Well, I didn't know that one. <laughs> Melissa mentioned something. Making coffee, washing dishes, making breakfast. What excites what excite, uh, your spouse by now? Number three is gifts. When's the last time uh, you got your, your spouse something without them knowing? Uh, these, these are little small things that make a big impact. Because when you're dating, normally you'll get them a, a rose or something. Or you'll, you'll get something out of the ordinary. But then after you are married for a while and you become so used to them, you don't think they really need that. But the needs never change. And so you gotta think, what, what is it I could spontaneously get them uh, to show my love out of the ordinary? The next one's a big one, quality time. I actually worked on Christmas Eve one time. And this is something that's being a, a pastor, I still work two days a week with El Cobo. So the first year I worked seven days a week, Never took a day off the rod. I can't do that. Um, and I get it from my dad because I feel like I need to be working all the time. Because if dad come home, me and Bob were playing video games, we wouldn't work in them. It's like dark outside. So, what are y'all doing? Granddad worked today. Was that it was snowing? How you work in snow? Yeah, you could have worked. So, he made us get on top of the roof of the house and shovel the snow off the roof because we didn't help granddad work in the snow. Right? So, that was instilled in me that you got to be working all the time. Like I worked at West Vegas for a summer and I was worried death day I was gonna come up uh, and catch me not work. Those guys up there don't let them feed for them. I mean they sat there and the guy cooked, he sat down and had uh, potatoes and he was cooking uh, hot dogs. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? He said, What do you mean when the sun sat down? I'm fixing some food. I'm like, my dad's working over the catch me. He said, Well, grab a broom and sweep up the floor, you're making me nervous. And you get that mentality, but you need to make sure you have quality time with your spouse. This is a huge one once you get married because you really don't think you need it. And especially if you have kids, this will get kind of um, lost. You need to have at least once every couple weeks of time where there's no kids and there's no focus on being on your phone. It's just you and your spouse and you guys have some kind of uh, get together because without that, you start growing apart. And marriage is based on not feeling necessarily. It's like salvation is based on the truth. The gentleman's got cancer. I told you this. He told me you got to base everything on truth, not feeling, because I don't feel good and I don't feel like having cancer. And a marriage would be days when you don't feel like loving your spouse. It would be days when you feel frustrated. But you do these things because Jesus Christ is this, what you need to do, and I did it for you, and you push through. But your marriage will be so much better if you follow these. So quality time, big one. If you're not doing that, do it. Take time, um, spend together, making your spouse your top priority. And you can always find out what's important if you just write it down. This made a 
huge impact in my life when I had to take a sheet of paper and I had to write down what I did every 15 minutes. I had a coach maybe do that. He said, write down what you do every day. So I'm too busy to do that. That's what I thought. I'm too busy to write down every 15 minutes what I'm doing. Now, you should do that no matter who you are. Because what I realized is I wasted almost my whole life. I thought I was busy. But then when he sat down and said, this is productivity and this is business. You know what? I caught myself. It was instilled in my mind. Grab my phone, check my email, check my email, check my email. Return all these emails, return, check this, do this. And I was busy, really doing nothing. And if you're not careful in life, you get busy and not being as productive. And with your spouse, you can get busy and you're not doing what they need, your husband needs, your wife needs. Uh, so make sure you're investing in them. Number five is physical touch. And everybody's different. Men and women are totally different. Matter of fact, Jump ahead of this. This is a study of a book I read in Dr. Forster's class on the needs of the man, the needs of the woman. And so, this is the man's top five needs. This is what I'm telling you about to ask you. I'm going to get to some of them here. What a man's top five is number one, sexual fulfillment. Number two, recreational companionship, doing things together. Number three, attractive spouse, believe it or not. They, they do like uh, you taking time for yourself. Number four, domestic support. That's the running of a home uh, and his need that's big to a man. And number five is respect. The respect is in the top five. And respect is something that you just don't think about. But men need, I know, we're needy, we're needy guys. Okay? We like to be built up. We like to feel like we're Superman. When you say something, it may look terrible. You say, man, you did a really good job uh, making those eggs, whatever it is. That makes you feel like Superman. Okay? And then all of a sudden, in return, it's going to make it easier for him to love you. Ladies' needs, number one's affection. Totally different, though. That's holding the hands. Uh, all the same baby that must have a reason for it. Sending cards, reassuring them when they're down. You know what I want to do? I want to fix problems. I swear I'm inside. A lot of men are. So if Melissa says, hey, I got this, and she says it, I'm like, stop right there. I've got a solution for it. This is what you need to do. In reality, I just need to be quiet, shut up, and listen. Just be there. And too often we want to we want to fix the problem. So that's number one. Number two is conversation. Man, I'm sorry, Hunter. I'm sorry, buddy. Still with me back there. Conversation. That's hard for me. Ladies like to talk. They want to talk to their husband. It's kind of like going into a this state plant. Well, some ladies don't want to talk that much. I think my wife, my wife don't want to talk that much. She works. But it's kind of like going to the Bass Pro Shop or going to the mall. When I go to the mall, I it already gets that headache. I cannot stand the mall. And sometimes they want to go to the mall. Now I go to the mall, looking around, get ready to shoot her and have something else. But I hate it. But that's just like communicating. It's not something that goes naturally. But your your wife, in most cases, wants to talk to you at some point. Conversation. It's number two on the list. Survey. Number three is honesty and openness. Just tell them uh, the truth and what's going on. And if somebody calls and tells you, hey, we need to do this at 7 o'clock on Friday night, make sure you tell your wife and don't tell her at 6 55 before it happens. Financial support, ladies, that's big. And a family commitment, that's huge for ladies. So you got to be committed to your uh, to your spouse. That's all in the physical touch part. I'll say this about kids too. Kids need physical touch more than anything. Young kids growing up, normally their uh, their personality and their mindset are made up of like eight years old. But throughout their life, this was eye opening to me when I took a class at Arizona Baptist that kids really need fourteen touches a day. That's a lot. You say what's a touch? Well, a touch on the shoulder, a hug. Okay, I, I love you. I hope you have a good day today. And these are things that get lost that I got lost in them. Just assuming if I'm in close contact to them, then I'm there. 
but there's quantity and there's quality. And a kid needs to know their love more than anything in the world. And they get that by just a touch of the shoulder, a hug, a uh, when your kid's talking, you should get down and get in high contact with them. So I had to learn. It makes a world of difference. They feel like, wow, mom and dad's taking enough time to actually listen to me. And then don't cut them off. Let them every now and then uh, talk to you and then discuss things with them. That's all touches. But 14 a day, that's a lot. And they used to get them from four people. <laughs> Maybe a good teacher or something would show some love. They don't get that anymore. And so it's up to the parents. And as crazy as our world is, it's insane as our world is, if you do what the Bible says, the kids are going to turn out okay. They really are. If you love them, if you show them the love of Christ, uh, if you show them the great example, they see that uh, mom and dad's relationship, they're working on it. They see that, and they know that they're being loved, and you're trying, they're going to be okay. Very important. Um, mention. I don't want to go too long, but I did mention the love bank. And you know, when you go to the bank, I'm talking a lot. Y'all good? Everybody good? I feel like I didn't talk too much. Are we, are we okay? You are the preacher. <laughs> Let's if you realize you met old preachers talking, there's nothing else to really doubt. <laughs> so I feel like I talked a lot. But y'all are good. Are we good? We need to take a break. Okay. We're almost done. Love bank. When you go to the bank, what do they ask? Say, I'll Take them a check for two hundred fifty dollars. Five hundred. What do they say? How would you? How would you like the money? Twenties, ten, hundreds, right? Don't they? <coughs> what if they just handed you the money? You're like, wait a minute, I need twenties. What if they just turn around and said, sorry? Actually, the Wendy's. This is where I get the most focus. I'm gonna tell you what. We went through Wendy's. Wendy's done. There, went through the word cookie. And then once you get a chocolate cookie in your mind, the guy took the order, paid the money, and uh, the guy was cussing in the, the drop. I'm like, this is crazy. So anyway, then he pulled up the thing, and he's like, we ain't got any cookies. What? Yeah. The guy took the order, took the money. Yeah, I don't know why he took that. We don't have any cookies. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, what in the world? And then, so they're they're laughing in there, and they're, they're ignoring us. I did all the bus and I just I was like, this is crazy. Like this is an actual restaurant here on Wednesdays. And they're like, I said, well, can we at least get the water that we oh yeah, they gave us water, no straw. Hey, I need straw for the water. <laughs> crazy. But they ask you, right? How do you want the money? Have you ever asked your spouse, hey, what is it that you're going to want out of me? What is it that drives you? And then are you willing to say, you know what, that is what makes me tick. And uh, I'm gonna work to do what they want because Christ goes all the way back to Jesus. He did it for me. I wouldn't be alive today if he didn't do it for me. I wouldn't be alive today if he didn't give up everything for me. I've got eternal life. So yes, sometimes is it hard? Is it easier to please ourselves? Of course, we always want to be pleased. But the more you do that, the husband's king and you're going to be queen. And if the um, God, if you make her king, queen, you're going to be king. So that relationship goes back and forth. And if you get a spouse that's 100% sold out trying to please the other person, and it may take a while, but then all of a sudden the other spouse turns and they want to spend 100% trying to please the other spouse. Those days when you have like 50%, you just do. You have those days. Wake up and it's just not your day. But the other person to give 100% and covers you for the day. You're only trying to give 50 and say, oh, that's a get 50%. Like giving an ounce more because they don't deserve it. And that person doesn't give full you And then you're not at 100, you have, you have a lot of problems. So remember that. Three things here. Don't forget every person needs to be loved. Every person needs to be respected. And every person needs to feel, feel appreciated. Very, very important. Very, uh, do that. Don't be like the couple that said, Said this, I can find it. Hold on, I finish the nine. Oh, yeah. So they were in marriage counseling, and the guy said, You need to find something that you can have in common to work off of. Okay, he said, Sorry. And they come back and he said, Did you find something that you have in common? Yes, great. Let's write it down. They wrote it down and said, This one thing we have in common 
We can't stand each other. <laughs> now, if that's you, guess what? You can still overcome that, but you have to be willing. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look in detail um, at a few things. But that's a quick basis of what can help. Marriage should be a good thing. God created it. Every part of marriage God created. When there's a problem, it's because of sin. But apart from sin, it's all about being an awesome marriage. Your kids will benefit from it. And uh, God will be on it. All right? Well, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, we'll, we'll be this from this, and we'll maybe take some questions. Lord, thanks so much for your word. We thank you for uh, the opportunities we have to learn more about you, learn more about the family. Thank you for the instruction manual. That'll be enough for you. Help us, guys, in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Oh, if you just put these uh, up here and, and stack them up for next week, we will we will go over them. All right. We won't take questions tonight because they're done. And we'll have maybe some discussion next week. <laughs>